Hi folks, Tris here. Thanks for listening to Mode and Prometheus, and thanks especially to all of you who have joined our Patreon. We don't run ads, so the whole podcast is supported by you. If you'd like to help out, head over to patreon.com forward slash modem prometheus. Members get behind the scenes notes, early access, bonus episodes, and a lot more exciting stuff. Today's story is called Time Coming, and is about things catching up with you. Dave is a professional photographer, and does not know how to tell Alex that the estate he has lived on for most of his life is cursed. It had started as a standard-sounding, if slightly unusual, commission. Dave had met Alex in a supermarket cafe, where the man had been so out of breath he'd barely been able to lift his cup of mundane tea. Sorry, it's this condition I have. Can barely walk a hundred metres without knocking myself out. Is it a heart problem? Dave asked. No idea. Doctors have been no use. Had it going on 50 years, would you believe? Cut down in my prime. I don't mind telling you, the day they invented home delivery of milk and tea bags was the happiest day of my life. Oh, sorry, if if I'd have known, I could have met you at your home. No, no, it's quite all right. Probably does me good. That's what I'll tell myself anyway. Though if I could persuade you to help me with my shopping afterwards, I would very much appreciate it. And he twinkled to make clear it was a joke. Dave had never met anyone who could legitimately twinkle before. The supermarket cafe was what happened when you turned beige into a building material. It was carefully designed that way, stripped of any personality that might make it a threat. Jude said they had weaponized neutrality, and that was why Dave liked them for his initial client meets. They let him assess the job without fear of prejudice. He was here because Alex wanted him to take pictures for a book. More a record, really. I live on the Barkham Fields estate. Do you know it? Dave shook his head. He did not. I've lived there almost my whole life. Was going to leave once, emigrating to Brazil. But in the end... I couldn't let that place go. Hard to imagine living somewhere that long. Well, that's the thing. I might not be able to much longer. The council have put in a motion to tear it down. Rehouse everyone all over the borough. And we've been fighting it, but honestly, I don't think we'll win. Once the suits get their minds set on something, they don't listen to people like us, eh? Alex pauses. Just that speech has left him visibly out of breath. But people are getting new homes, aren't they? Oh, of course, but not together. That's what they don't understand. A community isn't just the people in it. It's the collection. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And that's what's going to be lost. Completely lost. He pauses again, takes several breaths. Anyhow, that's why I want to do this. I want to record everyone who lives here. I want the community to be remembered after it's gone. My Amy always loved the community here. Your wife? Alas, gone many years now. I do miss her, but time comes for us all. Dave does take the job, and does help Alex with his shopping despite much half-hearted protesting from the old man. He pretends not to notice when Alex slips a chocolate bar into his pocket, which he gives to a young girl in the parking lot with a wink. Alex perks up the closer to his home they get. By the time they get there, he's positively sprightly. Here, I've made a list of all the names and addresses of everyone who's agreed to take part. They know I've been looking for a photographer. You should be able to... uh, What is it you young people say? Rock up? He waggles his eyebrows at this pretense of being merely middle-aged. Anyway, you should be able to just arrange appointments directly with them. But do talk to me if you have any problems. David spent the next day doing what research he could on the estate. Most of the search engine listings were estate agents. Very spacious. Character property requires modernization but there were a couple of local politics blogs about the demolition, and a local history site with some old photos. 
One of them had what was unmistakably a far younger version of Alex in the background, leaning on a railing and smoking a cigarette. The day after that, he'd spent making appointments with the people on Alex's list and taking establishing shots. The estate was made of three large blocks, forming a U, surrounding a central space laid with grass. One corner held a playground and a plaque saying, Paid for with funds raised by the Barkham Fields Improvement Committee. Dave filled his memory card with shots of the buildings, the bins, the playground and the walkways, covering as much as he could. Alex had asked for portraits, but he wanted a record of the community, and Dave thought the buildings themselves would count as part of that. They were the scaffolding that hundreds of lives cling to, barnacles attached to a sinking ship. It was when he got home and loaded the pictures onto his computer that he noticed all the ropes. They are everywhere. There was no question of his having not noticed them during the day. They strung their way through the estate like a swarm of twisting snakes. Some fell down walls, some draped across the sky like damp washing lines, some lay in slack curves across the pavement. And they are long. They come in one side of the picture and come out the other. They don't look thick, more twine than cable, but they make up for it in number. Several roll through every image. And that isn't even the most confusing thing. Hey, babe. Jude walks in, a pipe clenched between her teeth. She has tried to give up smoking seven times and eventually decided to turn it into a feature rather than a bug. Who's that? That... Dave says, is a woman who shouldn't exist. The picture he looks at is of one of the walkways that run the length of each block, connecting all the front doors on that floor. A woman stands at one of those doors, wearing a floral blouse with lapels that look like they could hide a plane. She has one hand and her forehead pressed to the wood, flattening the front of her small afro. She wasn't there, Dave says. When I took that picture, she wasn't there. And not only that, look at this. He shows Jude a different picture, of the same walkway but without the woman. This is the same picture. I mean, it's obviously not. No, it is. Look, whenever I take a shot, I get two files, okay? One's a JPEG, that's the version the camera processes to make it look good. One's a RAW, that's got all the data in it so I can mess around with contrast and exposure and stuff in post. This one, he points at the woman's walkway, is the JPEG. This one, he expects to say, is the RAW, as he opens up the original file again. But what he actually says is, Jesus! and slams his chair suddenly backwards because the woman isn't staring at the door anymore. She's staring straight down the lens. She has a long, thin face, cheekbones that could slice butter and a look of vacant resignation. Jude sucks on her pipe thoughtfully. Here's a plan. How about you delete that picture and we never speak of this again? Dave peers at the screen carefully but the woman doesn't seem inclined to move again. Something's wrong with this picture. Jude looks at Dave in the screen, and back again, as if to say she thought they had already established that. Yeah, beside that, he says. Look, the plane of focus is all the way over here. I was focusing on one of the other doors. The door she's next to is all blurred out. But she's in perfect focus, Jude says. Honestly, I feel like this is a point in favour of my never speak of this again plan. No. Dave shakes his head. I want to find out what's going on. Jude shrugs. You're cool. But if she crawls out of that monitor with all that hair over her face, you better believe my last words to you will be, I told you so. Dave and Jude are not killed in the night. And so he arrives at the estate with half an hour to spare, before his first appointment, 
equipped with camera, tripod, flash and phone. Okay, he mutters. Let's see if this works. He takes a photo of the estate. On his camera screen, it's the same as what his eyes tell him is there. The buildings hunkered like decaying spaceships of red brick brutalism. Then he Bluetooths it to his phone, and in the Raw Viewer app, the ropes are strung across the screen. They go in all directions, but clearly all come from the same spot in one of the buildings. One of them drifts down toward the playground climbing frame. He decides to check it out, and is taking pictures of the frame from all angles when he's suddenly shoved bodily to one side by the impact of a handbag to his ribs. What you doing? What you doing, eh? His accoster is small and round, and seems to have shoved him with momentum born more of rage than muscle. Grey, frizzy hair stands out against her dark skin. She wears what has to be a dress, because sacks don't have waistlines, and carries a brown leather bag which is swung toward him again. You spy on the place! I seen you talking to that bum bowl yesterday! What's he got you doing, eh? You spying on me! No, no! Dave shields his camera with one hand while holding up the other in what he hopes is a conciliatory manner. I'm doing a project about the estate. I guess you're not on his list. His list? Ha! <laughs> Only list I'm on is his hit list. But he's not getting rid of me. He ain't ever getting rid of me. You tell him that. Um, okay. I will. And don't you point that camera at me. I won't. The woman squints at him, as if trying to work out if her argument needs any more handbag-based emphasis. Deciding the point has been made, she bustles off. Dave shakes his head and looks at his watch. Time for the first appointment. Investigating the rope will have to wait. Composition is what drew Dave to photography. Being able to tell a story in the interplay between subject and background. Exposure. White balance. Contrast. These are all malleable in post-production. The computer changing reality to a better version of itself. But the composition. The position of the person within the frame. What inner worlds they stared into. Or how they smiled into the lens. That is fixed. A tiny, perfect slice of time. That is what it is and can never again be changed. The first session is with a middle-aged woman who lives alone. Never had a man, she says. Never will. Dave takes her portrait standing defiant, the hoe she uses on her allotment held like a spear. Such a nice idea, she says. I've told Alex I'll buy a copy from him. Obviously, he said he'd get them printed for all of us for free, but he should get something. That could be expensive, he seems to know everyone here. Wouldn't surprise me, man's a complete busybody, but he's very sweet. Not everyone seems to like him, Dave says, and tells her about the woman with the handbag. Oh, mad Aggie, don't worry about her, she doesn't like anyone. His second is a young family, who had bought the flat only to learn of the demolition order a few months later. He takes pictures of them looking uncomfortable, sat inside the walls that should be home, but where the roots they'd tried to put down had been sliced off. His third is Alex. Hello, come in. It was something of a relief to see Alex's smiling face. I've just put the kettle on. It's milk, right? Normal milk. Not any of this oat milk stuff. Don't know why I'm asking. Don't keep any in the house. Very strange stuff. Doesn't feel like milk if it doesn't come out of a cow, you know? Oh, yes. Thanks. I heard you had a run-in with Mad Aggie. Everyone calls her that, huh? Oh, I know it's cruel, but she does live up to it. Lovely woman when you get to know her, but if I'm honest, she's a few biscuits short of a pack. Why doesn't she like photos? Oh, who knows? Whatever's gotten into her head today. Maybe she thinks you're some kind of witch doctor and they'll steal a bit of her soul. I wasn't even taking a picture of her. Well, there's no accounting for Aggie. Do you know, she's been here almost as long as I have. Never really fit in. Even before she was a bit... 
Alex waved a hand as if trying to work out how to say senile without actually saying senile. Still, I guess it's harder. Being someone of that type. That type? You know, coloured. Not normal. Dave winced, thinking of how Jude would explode if she was part of this conversation. You shouldn't call people that. Hmm? What? Coloured. You shouldn't call people coloured. It's not a good term. Oh, of course, yes. I forgot things had changed. I don't really keep up. Don't understand it myself. It was fine in my day. Not like I'd referred to her as a... Alex stops himself to Dave's immediate relief. Well, yes. (laughs) Seems a perfectly polite term to me, but not really for me to decide, is it? (laughs) Anyhow, where do you want me? Make sure you get every wrinkle and crag, mind. Can't have people saying I was airbrushed. Yes. Right. Dave gratefully grabbed the subject change with both hands. We've got some good light in your living room at the moment. Maybe we could start there. He shoots some portraits lit on one side by the light from the window, giving it a more dramatic cast as Alex looks into a wistful past. He takes some more of the old man sat smiling on a sofa, hands on his knees, a mug of steaming tea and a piled plate of bourbon biscuits in front of him. They take some in the kitchen. No, Alex says. It's a tip in there. I haven't done the washing up in a couple of days. My Amy would turn in her grave to see the state of it. Then do it, Dave replies. And I'll shoot while you do. It's everyday life here. Exactly what we want. Some as he watered the plants on his small balcony. Some as he looked at a portrait of one of his cats. She was so lovely. Had a good life, but time comes for us all. There is one more flat to visit. This isn't one of his appointments, and he isn't quite sure what to say. Do you know this ghost? Doesn't feel like it's going to work as a conversation opener. Eventually... He takes a deep breath and raps three times on the door the woman had been standing in front of. There is a shuffling from inside and the lock clicks. The door opens to reveal mad Aggie, who takes one look at him and slams it back in his face. Dave should be editing his pictures. Instead, he's looking at the woman in her strange, perfect focus. Every time he looks at the picture, he expects her to have moved closer. But she's still there, still looking at him. Her eyes follow him like a snake tracking prey. Yo, babe! Jude leans over the back of his chair. She kisses his head with tobacco-scented lips. I found our friendly neighbourhood Sadako. You know who she is? No, but I found another picture, and I think she's alive in it. Jude hands him a phone, showing the local history site Dave had found earlier. In fact, she's showing him the same picture. There's a younger Alex, smoking, leaning against the railing. A few metres down from him is the woman. She's talking to someone, caught with her hand mid-gesture. That's her, right? Yeah, that's her. So she lived there? I guess so. Shame no one else from back then is likely to still be around. Actually, Dave says, someone is. And he brings up the picture of Alex. Then he says, huh, because the ropes weren't coming from somewhere. They are going somewhere. They force their way through Alex's window sealant, come up his drain and under his front door. They curl around every limb, clench around his heart, and wrap around his throat. And that's not even the scary part. The woman is standing in Alex's hall doorway, looking at him with an expression like sadness. Behind her, a crowd of less distinct shapes. Dave can't make out much even with the exposure and contrast whacked up as far as they'll go, but he can see eyes, fists, 
a hand holding a rope. It tells a story, but what one, Dave isn't sure. Is she protecting him? Jude asks. Maybe, Dave says. I think I need to ask. Oh, hello! Alex opens the door with his ever-present sunshine smile. I wasn't expecting you back today. His eyes suddenly go wide. Oh, is is it the pictures? Are they okay? I can do more if you want more. Maybe not right now, because I'm meant to be doing a shift at the food bank in 20 minutes, but I could... No, no, that's okay. Dave interrupts him before Alex gets himself caught in a loop of people-pleasing. I just wanted to ask you a couple of things. Oh, of course, of course. Come in, come in. Would you like some tea? I made a pot. I always make a pot, even though it's only me. Drove my poor Amy absolutely up the wall. She didn't drink tea, you see. Coffee only for her. Milk and one, wasn't it? Knowing he would be receiving tea, regardless of how this conversation went, Dave went, yes, please. Alex bustled back, tea in hand. So, how can I help? Dave hands him a copy of the picture from the local history site. Just the woman and her friend, Alex himself cut out. I found this old picture online that was taken on the estate. I wondered if you knew her. Might be a good thing to include some history. Alex looks at it, his eyes briefly wide, then his face settles into a confused frown. Can't say I do. Do you know when it was taken? My memory's not what it was, I'm afraid. And the site said 1975. I don't know if that's accurate. Probably his 70s, though, judging by the dress. No, doesn't ring a bell. Okay, um, thanks. Was that all? Yes, that was all. He hadn't meant it to be all. He'd meant to show Alex the other pictures, show how he was tied down, show the woman holding back whatever it was that gathered around him show her standing in front of mad Aggie's door like a prison guard. But he doesn't. Something seems wrong. That flicker of suppressed reaction when he saw the woman brought back to life, that brief, happy gesture. He leaves with Alex a few minutes later, the old man chatting amiably as he locks the door. Dave wonders if he can feel the pull if he knows how much more effort every step was taking him. Dave has more appointments, more portraits to take. When he's done, he takes the picture of the woman with her head leaning on the flat door, writes, Do you know her? with his phone number on the back of it, and posts it through Mad Aggie's letterbox. He's only taken three steps away from the door when it opens. Okay, she says. Fine. You come in. There is no tea or biscuits on offer here. Dave is led into a room with walls stained yellow through dirty tobacco, a pair of threadbare armchairs, and incongruously, China Shepherdess sat primly on a small table. Sit. He has pointed to one of the chairs, which creaks alarmingly as he sits down. Aggie sits in the other, and lights a pipe that could be the twin of Jude's. Okay, tell me. How do you have that picture? I took it a couple of days ago, Dave replied. Look, Aggie, is it? Agatha, she snapped. They call me Aggie, mad Aggie. He started it blood clat that he is Alex Agatha gives him a withering look no the milkman of course Alex okay okay Dave gestures to the picture I've been trying to find out about her I know she's here somewhere but I don't even know who she is ha Agatha laughs like a gun crack she here all right she in this room Dave jumps, looking around. You can see her? No. But she family. You know when family's close by. She sighs. 
Sister, she says. She was my sister. Amancia. Amancia? Dave joins the dots. Wait. Amy? Is that Alex's wife? Amy? Pah! He couldn't even get her name right. So what happened to her? Agatha sucks on the pipe like she's trying to pull the tobacco out through the back. I don't know. I know I have letters from her, saying she has met this wonderful man, how they will live their lives together, how she is so happy. And I'm happy for her, and then... the letters stop. There is nothing, no word, no money sent home. So I have a bad feeling. I come. And she is not here. Who is here? Him. She spits the word so hard Dave expects to hear a ding in a bucket. And I can feel her. She hangs over him like decay. I did some research on the history here. I couldn't find anything about it. Of course you don't. You look like me, you look like a mancia. History here doesn't care what happens to you. So I go to him. I tell him I know he's done something and he will pay for it. What does he do? He laughs. He says, My dear girl, I never pay for anything when I don't have to. Dave starts. It's a far better impression of Alex than he expected. Then he tells me he's going to Brazil. Brazil. And leaving all these boring people behind. Leaving all his bodies too. Oh yes. No. He is not leaving. I am not my grandmother, but I know some of her tricks. He is going nowhere. You made those ropes. You tied him down. Agatha laughs. You bet I did. Her expression suddenly changes. Wait, you see those too? Give me that damn camera. What about the other things in his house? The what? For the first time... Agatha looks confused. Dave shows her the picture of Amancia standing in front of the other shapes. Agatha looks at it and smiles grimly. No. No. That was not me. That was them. She taps one of the shapes on the screen. The suggestion of a well-built man with a large beard. That is our father. Oh. I'm not the only one in my family who cares about Amancia. I guess not. You tell me about your camera. The ghosts. I don't know about the ghosts, but my spell. I can stop it from appearing. Always the edge cases. You test and test, but there's always one more. No, that's okay. Dave looks at the camera sat on the table, full of slices of captured time. I think it's actually better like this. Dave takes another set of portraits the next day, and more the day after. He keeps the shots inside to avoid Agatha's ropes trailing across the image. The light's not as good, but it'll save a few afternoons of Photoshop work. He finds himself in front of Alex's door three times, and every time walks away. With the light fading on the second day, he realises he can't let this end without bringing the picture into focus. Hello again. I wanted to talk to you about Amancia. Oh? Alex's smile doesn't so much as twitch. Of course, come in. Dave sits down, takes the picture of the woman and lays it on the table. I showed you this before, and you said you'd never seen her before. But you have, haven't you? You do remember her. Hmm. Alex seems deep in thought. You know, I feel like this conversation might take a while. Let me fetch some biscuits. You don't, Dave starts, but Alex has already bustled off. A couple of minutes later, he returns with a plate of custard creams and a pot of tea. Okay, then, Alex says, sitting down again. Would you mind awfully turning your phone off? Dave frowns, but does so, leaving it face up on the table. Yes, 
I do remember her. Very well, in fact. She was Amy. She was your wife. And something happened to her. You. Alex raises his eyebrows and smiles encouragingly, like a teacher with a pupil who is so close to working out five times three. You killed her, Dave says. I don't know how, but I think you did. I'm going to be very interested to know how you came to that conclusion, Alex says, genially. He pours them some tea, hands not shaking so much as a millimetre. But you're not quite there. She wasn't my wife. That was the problem, in fact. Dave blinks. But you did kill her? Oh, yes. We got into a bit of an argument. She wanted to get married, and it's not that I didn't want to. But a man like me, a woman like her, it just wasn't done so much in those days. Would have caused comment, you know? Attention. And I don't mind saying I was involved in a couple of things where I didn't really want attention, if you know what I mean. He says this with a smile. Wasn't I a scamp? Alex looks gently into the past, thoughtfully munching on a biscuit. Anyhow, we got into an argument about it, and I'm afraid I entirely lost my temper. Hit her far harder than I meant to, and she went straight down onto the kitchen floor. It was instant, I believe. I do hope so. I was quite cut up. What did you do with the body? Alex smiles sadly and shakes his head. Sorry, my boy. There's no changing the past, and I don't mind confirming your suspicions. But as it stands, I don't believe you can prove a thing, and I don't intend to help you change that. No. I guess not, Dave says. Are you sorry for it? Alex shrugs. Of course. I did like her. Very much. But there's no sense in dwelling on it. Time comes for us all. And if it came for Amy sooner than it should, it didn't change much in the grand scheme of things. Dave stands up. Okay. I'm done. You're right. I can't prove anything. I'm not going to go to the police. Got one more set of portraits to do tomorrow. Then it'll be a week for editing and I'll send you all the files when I'm done. Leaving already? You've not touched your tea? I'd rather not stay, thanks. As Alex walks him to the door, he says, Well, I must say I'm impressed by your ability to compartmentalise. Most people wouldn't be able to let that go. Honestly, the reason I can is that it's not mine to let go, Dave says. It's hers. And he hands Alex a copy of the other picture. The one with Amancia standing in front of the shaded figures. He had thought she was holding them back. Now, he sees, she is at the head of a mob. Always has been. As Alex looks at the picture, the figures behind her slide into focus with their fists their ropes, their sticks, their teeth and their hard, angry eyes. I don't need to prove anything, Dave says. She's waiting for you. Her whole family's waiting for you. Well, Alex says, staring at the picture with the face of a man who now knows indisputably that time is coming for him. Well, yeah, Dave says and he leaves, shutting the door behind him. Murder in Prometheus is written by Neil Merton, the voice of the city is Kate Angier, and with music and production by me, Tris Oten. Check out my other show, Lost Terminal. It's got more science and less dread. For bonus episodes and behind-the-scenes content, join our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Prometheus. If you're not ready for that kind of commitment, please rate and review us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you're listening to this right now. Our next story is due on the Smoke Moon on the 4th of June, and is about the things you find in the dark. And remember, one, ghosts, like climate change, don't care if you believe in them, and two, you don't need to believe in ghosts, they believe in you.